ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير ولكم باك تو أبريبادي for another session. Um, I want to start off by talking just very quickly about the timing. Inshallah, going forward for the next little while at least, this will be the fixed timing. Uh, so inshallah, uh, we will try to stay consistent with 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. for the class, inshallah, uh, which should give everybody good opportunity to pray your Maghrib Salah, relax for a little bit, join the class, and then um, you have time for Isha, inshallah. Uh, in the evening, if you're going to the Masajid, most Masajid have Isha at 7.30. Um, so let's do a quick recap and, and jump right into today's class. Um, so we, we've been talking about worship. We talked about uh, the reasons why we do things. Um, we talked about who is a Muslim and the key differentiator, differentiation that we said between Muslims and non-Muslims of any type is the fact that we worship only Allah and only Allah is the only one worthy of worship. And then we talked about or started talking about what is worship. <clears throat> and when we're talking about what is worship, just as a reminder, it's about respecting and having love and honor. Um, it is um, Allah created us specifically and exclusively to worship him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is ritual worship, which we do, such as Salah and reciting Quran and such. And usually, we, I think we all agreed it takes about one hour of every day to do that. And we started talking about what about the rest of the 23 hours. Um, and through that process, we came to a conclusion based on, on ayat from the Quran and hadith that, the, that our, desires, our desires can become a god because we end up worshiping our desires. Um, and... Also, we discussed that if somebody is changing halal to haram or haram to halal, and we follow those rulings or those uh, uh, things that people are changing, those rules, then that becomes worship of those people as well. Okay, so let's move on now to the topic of who do we worship? We all know it's Allah. Right? There's nobody, everybody knows the name Allah. But if somebody was to ask you, and I say somebody, let's say, whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim, was to ask you, who do you worship? And you say Allah, and they say, who is that? How would we answer that? How would we answer who is Allah? So before I start explaining, is there anybody who wants to try and uh just quickly, maybe give me a few words or, or sentences of how you would describe who is Allah. How would you answer that question? Allah is who we worship, too. Allah is who we worship, yes, but who is Allah? He's so, as an example, sorry, God. go ahead. He's like the creator of the world, like the God. God. Okay, so creator. Okay, so I'm not going to accept the God as the answer or the first answer. And I'll tell you why, because that's like me saying, if somebody says, um, who is Ahmad? Me. Okay. And you say, oh, he's a man. 
that's not very descriptive. <laughs> it's not very helpful, right? Or if you say, oh, he has a beard. That's, again, there's a lot of people like that. So who is Allah, right? And especially think of this, think of this. If we are worshiping Allah, and we know that we do it because primarily most of us, we do it because our parents told us to worship Allah, right? And we do it because then we start to read the Quran and we see or we hear lectures and they say, yes, you should worship Allah. You have to worship Allah. We worship Allah. And so in our minds, we say, yeah, we worship Allah. So if you think back to the previous few uh, classes that we've had so far, you know, I, I would I would say many of us didn't even know what the definition of worship was. And we would say to people, yes, we worship Allah, but we don't know what the definition of worship is. And now, <clears throat> inshallah, I hope that we all have a bit of a better understanding of what the definition of worship is. But now who is it that we worship? Because just to say we worship Allah, that's fine. And one of the answers was that uh, that he is the creator. And this is one of the best answers. And we'll get into that as we move forward right now. But I want you to think about this. Because again, the whole point of these, these classes, inshallah, is for us to establish critical thinking. For us to be able to open our minds and really try to understand why it is what we do. And um, to really solidify Tawheed, the oneness of Allah in our hearts, <clears throat> so that our actions start to reflect more and more uh, actions of a Muslim and to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so there are uh, some ayat on the screen. Um, I would like to request somebody to recite these other than our usual reciter. And the reason I'm saying that is because this one everybody should be able to recite. So I, I need a volunteer, please. How can you read? Zakirullah, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik Yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka na'sa'in. Barakallahu feek. Jazakum Allah khair. And now let's look at the translation of these ayat. Okay. So in the name of Allah, and I'm going uh, I'm gonna go through this in, in quite a bit of detail or a little bit more detail than what you see on the screen. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. All the praises and thanks be to Allah, the Lord of al alamin meaning mankind, jinn, and all that exists. The entirely merciful, the especially merciful, the only owner of the day of judgment, the day of recompense. It is you we worship, and you, we ask for help. Now, this is Surah Al-Fatiha, the very first surah, the very first chapter of the Quran. This is something very interesting about the Quran, by the way. You pick up almost any book on the face of this earth, and it will start off by telling you who wrote the book. It will have an author. And... Usually the author will have some explanation, a preface or something to explain what the book is about and so on and so forth. And almost every single book, again, on the face of the earth will have some mention in the book that says, if you find any errors, please contact us and they'll give you contact information, a postal address or an email address or a phone number or something like this. The Quran, we know, is the speech of Allah. It is the kalam of Allah. It is the speech of Allah. Okay, this is very, very important point for us to understand <clears throat> and, um, and appreciate. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the Quran without an author, without uh, requesting anybody for corrections because it is absolutely perfect. There is no mistakes in this whatsoever. And people have tried throughout the years people have tried 
their best to find mistakes and not one yet to this day. Now, if you were to talk to somebody, uh, non-Muslims, some of them will say, no, look, there's a contradiction here and this is a mistake here. And they're all false. They're all false information. The reason they're false is they take things out of context. They don't understand the correct, they're not translating things correctly. Um, and there's other issues with that. So <clears throat> if you were to ever uh, see or hear something like that, do not fall victim. Do not become a victim of that by saying, oh, look at that, they're right. All of these classes, all of these years I've been listening about Quran and Quran being perfect. No, it's not. No, don't fall into this trap. This is shaitan that comes and whispers in your ear and makes creates doubts in your heart. Don't fall for these things. If ever you find some material like this that is causing you confusion, always ask somebody of knowledge. Okay, so you ask, you to either take it to your parents or you take it to the imam of a masjid or something like this. And you say, look, this is what somebody is saying. So please help me understand. I know it can't be wrong, but I want to understand what is the, where is the misunderstanding? Okay, and if you do not get a satisfactory answer, because this is a very big thing. Many people I know have said, I did do that. I went to the imam of my masjid and I asked them and they couldn't answer. I wasn't satisfied. Then go to another one or go to another one after that and after that and after that. It is your responsibility to clear your confusion. Nobody else is responsible for that. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts by introducing himself. And <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, <clears throat> where ar-Rahman and ar-Rahim are two names of Allah. And both of these are coming from the word rahma, mercy. Okay, so it's very interesting that the very first thing that Allah talks about himself and tells us about is his mercy. And when you look at Arabic grammar, the, the uh, merciful and extremely merciful. Okay, so both of these words, Ar-Rahman and Rahim, are... They complement each other and they're very comprehensive. So Rahman is used only to describe Allah. Okay. You cannot use Rahman to describe anything or anybody else. Whereas Rahim may be described or may be used to describe a person as well. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ was described in the Quran as Rahim. Okay. Rahman though, it is above the human level, right? It, it has so much mercy, or the word Rahman describes so much mercy that it is not possible for a human to be able to uh, express that amount of mercy. That is exclusively for Allah. Um, and when we look at the word Rahim, it also implies con continuality, meaning um, usually when we think of intensity, something very strong happens, we usually think it's something for a very short amount of time. But Rahim also indicates that this is its continuous mercy. It doesn't end. Rahman also carries a wider meaning of being merciful to all of the creation, having um, justice being part of that mercy. Rahim includes the concept of speciality, meaning especially or specifically merciful to the believers, to the Muslims. And forgiveness is part of this mercy. Okay, and I think the last point on this is that um, Rahman is like uh, an adjective. It is, it's referring to an attribute of Allah and it is part of his essence. Whereas Rahim is more, uh, verbal, it, 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 it indicates what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, meaning he's bestowing and implementing his mercy. Okay. Then after the basmala, after bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, all praise and thanks be to Allah. So we're being taught to praise Allah first and foremost. Why? Who is this Allah? 
Lord of everything that exists. Al Alameen is everything that exists, not just the humans, not just Muslims, not just humans and jinn, everything, absolutely everything that exists, everything that we know of and everything that we still don't know of. Right. So when we think of things that exist that Allah created, it's not even just tangible physical things that we know of, like trees and rocks and mountains and people and animals and earth and planets and stars and space itself, but also even things like time. Even time, which is not something that you can see or feel, but we measure it, even that is something that Allah has created. So this is this our Allah has created absolutely all of this and is the Lord of all of this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us um, again that the entirely merciful and the especially merciful. So now after Allah says to praise him, then explains who he is, the Lord of al Alameen, then Allah starts to explain again who Allah is. His first attributes that he explains is Ar-Rahman and Rahim. Again, mercy. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to saying the owner and the only owner, the master or the ruling judge of the day of recompense. Day of recompense or day of resurrection, or day of judgment. These all are referring to the same thing. And then we say it is you that we worship and that you we ask for help. So when we look at all of this, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts uh, saying that um, in the name of Allah. So that's something that we should we should be very mindful of for everything. We should be starting with Bismillah. And we talked about this uh, in, in, I think, the first class. Then we praise Allah. Then we recognize the absolute mercy of Allah then recognize the consequence of displeasing Allah. And how am I saying this? Because when Allah says that he is the, uh, the owner and the master of the day of judgment, if you did everything good, then you have nothing to fear and the day of judgment is good for you. But if you did some evil deeds or you disbelieved outright, then you have a lot to worry about. Because Allah is the master of the day of judgment. And on that day of judgment, Allah will be the judge, the only judge. And so Allah talks about his mercy. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the fact that Allah will be the judge on the day of judgment. And so that is for us to recognize the consequence of displeasing Allah. And then recognizing tawheed, the oneness of Allah. Um, and that the only one deserving of worship is Allah. You alone we worship. It is you we worship. It says the translation here, and probably a better translation would have been, it is you alone we worship, and you alone that we ask for help. So Allah begins the Quran by describing himself. And something that's important for us, this is something that we recite in every raka, every unit of our salah, of our prayer, we are reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. And so this should be a constant reminder. Whenever we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, this should be a constant reminder for us that who is Allah, who it is that we are worshiping, and even answering a lot of the questions about why we are worshiping is in here. Okay. Then we move on. Uh, and let's look at a few different ayat, and we're gonna. I'm gonna try to move a little bit quickly through these because um, I have several ayat, and there are so so many more in throughout the Quran. Um, but I just I just picked a few to highlight some of the points that uh, we'll be moving through for the class today, inshallah. Okay, so we look at Surah Al-Baqarah, and I have just translations going from here forward just to uh, in the interest of time so surah al-baqarah ayat 21 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O mankind worship your lord worship allah who has created you and those before you so that you may become al-muttaqun so that you may become pious now this is very important this is going back to the point I, uh, when i asked 
how do you describe Allah? Somebody said, because Allah created. And this is it right here in Surah Al-Baqarah. And it comes multiple, many, many other places as well, by the way. Um, Allah has created you and me, and Allah has created everybody before us. In fact, Allah has created everything. But what is so interesting here is why did Allah create us? We know that in, we've talked about that Allah created us, mankind and jinn, only to worship Allah. Right? This was what Allah says in the Quran further down in another ayah. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also telling us so that we may become al-muttaqun, so that we may become the pious people. So part of our creation is to worship Allah. But when we worship Allah, that in and of itself makes us al-muttaqun, that makes us pious. When we worship Allah, because whatever Allah, when we worship Allah, mean, meaning that we're obeying Allah, we're following what Allah has told us to do, and we're also staying away from what Allah has told us not to do, the prohibitions. And when we, when we follow these commandments, when we follow what Allah has asked us to do and to not do, Allah knows what's good for us. Somebody tell me, I think my, my voice cut out there. What was the last thing that I said? Can you hear me now? Can everybody hear me okay? Can somebody just unmute? Yeah. Okay. All right. So when we, when we obey Allah, when we... Uh, follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments, what to do and what not to do. It is Allah's commandments are, be, are based on the fact that Allah knows what's good for us. And because we're following those things that are good for us by worshiping Allah, which is the exclusive reason why Allah created us, that also makes us pious. That makes us from the al-muttaqun. Okay, another ayah. Such is Allah, your Lord. None has the right to be worshipped but he. The creator of all things. So worship him alone. And he is the wakil, the trustee, the one that is the guardian over all things. The one that is watching over everything. Okay, so from these two ayats, we figure out or we can, we can try and summarize it to say that A, Allah is the creator. And it is about creation. So going back to the question, who do Muslims worship? Somebody says to you, who do you worship? You say Allah. And they say, who is Allah? The first answer that we should have, Allah is the creator of everything that exists. Okay, so now I'm going to sort of just go a little bit more in detail about this. Because this, there is a big issue with the Muslim community globally not just here in our locality here or in Canada or the United States, North America, or the Western world, as they say, like Europe and North America. No, this is a global problem where, and it, in fact, it's not even for just Muslims. It in fact, it's, it's, this issue is infecting, affecting and infecting um, people of all religions, people of all faiths. And that issue is that people are abandoning their religions. They are abandoning their faith completely. And as a result, what they say is they say, I am now atheist. I do not believe in anything. And I believe in science. Okay. What they are actually doing is they are worshiping themselves. They're worshiping their desires and their own intellect they feel that they are smarter than everybody else and they have figured out what is life and everybody else that follows a religion is dumb and they don't know um, but if you talk to these people the core issue for them the very core fundamental issue is about creation it is about accepting that some power, somebody, some being has created all of this. This is what 
these people cannot digest. They cannot figure it out. Their minds do not allow them to comprehend their hearts. Maybe Allah has put a seal on it. Only Allah knows best. But their hearts do not open up to accept that Allah is the creator and created absolutely everything that exists. And because this is so hard for them to, to accept, they abandon this entire concept and they say, no, I know what it is. It's the Big Bang Theory or it's the evolution theory of evolution that, you know, your grandfather is a monkey and my grandfather is a monkey and so on and so forth. And I'm obviously exaggerating and also oversimplifying it. I understand that. But I'm just trying to make a point that this is a very huge issue. And this is the core fundamental difference between Muslims and non-Muslims of any type. Again, it is that we worship Allah alone and we believe that Allah has the, is the one that created absolutely everything that exists. And when you can appreciate that, when you understand that, and this is how Allah is introducing himself too. Up to, to us, right? In Surah Al-Fatiha, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, uh, Alameen, meaning the Lord of everything that exists, then these are the points that are very critical for us to reflect upon, very critical for us to keep in mind at all times and be mindful of at the same time. Okay. Um, let's look at some more <clears throat> ayat. So, we worship Allah, the one true God, who all the prophets also worshipped. Right? If we look at this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah 133, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what could mean. Or were you witnesses when death approached Yaqub? When he said to his sons, what will you worship after me? Imagine this. This is a prophet of Allah, Yaqub alayhi salam. And he is on his deathbed. And he calls his sons. His sons are there. And he says, what will you worship after me? This, you know, many people, if, if you were to talk to people that have been around other people that have passed away at the moment of their death, um, many of them are talking very nonsense or foolish things, right? And usually it is what is their inner desires, what their desires are the most about, that is usually what their last words will be. That is, those are the things that they're concerned about the most. And um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a few examples that I've heard from scholars that have, have actually experienced this, right? So one example is one scholar, uh, you know, somebody called and said, please, can you come to our house, our so-and-so of our family member? He's about to pass away. And so he goes, and as he's approaching the house from a little bit of a distance, he hears very loud music, very loud music. And he's amazed. He's like, what is going on here? And as he gets closer, it's getting louder. It's coming from the house that he's supposed to go into. And he goes and he sees the people there, the family members, and he says, what is this? What are you guys doing? Why are you playing this music so loud? This man is about to die and you called me to come and, you know, be with him and, and comfort him and, you know, maybe say some dua for him. and." you're playing this loud music, which is haram. And they said, we tried everything. We tried putting the Quran on. We tried reciting Quran for him. We tried um, reciting athkar for him. We tried do it, saying, keep it quiet, no sound. But he kept asking us to put on such and such a person's music. There's some famous musician that or, or, or singer that he wanted to listen to. And he kept insisting and insisting and they, they, they put it on for him. And he died listening to that music. That is what he had in his heart. That is what was important for him. That's what he died listening to. There's another one. I'll share this one, just one more, just to give you another example that's a little bit different. Similar scenario. They call, the, they call for you know, the imam to come to the house try and comfort this person who's about to pass away it seems like and he comes to the house and uh, you know there's people family members sitting around and when the imam walks in uh, he goes towards the person and says uh, you know assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam he's like say la ilaha illallah say la ilaha illallah instead you know this man kept saying say three four five six and he's counting 
counting. And then he's like 500, 1700, 18. I'm making up the numbers. I don't remember what the numbers are, but he's counting. And he's like, say la ilaha illallah. And, he's, and he keeps counting. And then he turns to the family members and he's like, what is, what is he, why is he counting? What is happening here? They said, this man loves his money. He would always count his money. He would always spend time counting his money, how much money he has. And he died counting. This is what, what came to him. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us about Yaqub alayhi salam. And when he is about to die and he's on his deathbed and he calls his sons, he says, what will you worship after me? And they said, we shall worship your God, the God of your fathers, Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, one God, and to him we will submit. Now, this is interesting. They're saying, your God, Yaqub alayhi salam, my father, in this case, their father, your God, and the God of your fathers, in plural. Why? Because this is, this is generational. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail, Ishaq uh, alayhi salam. And so, and then they say, one God, and to him we will, also, we will submit, meaning we will obey Allah. When they say we submit, submission, um, if any of you are familiar with um, MMA, for example, mixed martial arts, right, where people are, uh, it's like boxing and kicking and so on, and they're, they're fighting in a ring and so on, and if somebody is in a lot of pain, they submit. They submit, and that means the match is over, he's lost, the one who submitted lost, okay? So, in Islam, we submit our will to Allah, meaning our desires to Allah, meaning that whatever it is that Allah wants for us to do, that is what we accept and we will do. Whatever Allah tells us not to do, that is what we accept and we will stay away from those things. And this is what um, the sons of Yaqub also said. Okay, then we move on. So we see that we worship Allah and call others who follow different religions to also worship Allah, right? And here in the Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, uh, ayat 64, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what could mean? Say, meaning to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O people of the scripture, referring specifically to the Jews and Christians, come to a word that is just between us and you. And a word means the where it says a word, that means um, like a statement, okay? Like a, um, to, to a, a sentence. It doesn't literally mean one word it's referring to a statement so come to a word that is just between us and you what is that statement what is that word that we worship none but allah and we associate no partners with him and that none of us shall take others as lords besides allah this is the invitation this is the invitation that we have for all the non-muslims we worship none but allah that is sufficient, by the way. Just saying that we worship none but Allah is sufficient. Because if it's none except Allah, of course there's no partners or associates. But it's explicit. It goes even more into detail just to make sure that there's no confusion. And we associate no partners with him. And that none of us shall take others as lords besides Allah. Then if they turn away, say, bear witness that we, we are Muslims. Why? Because we worship only Allah. Okay, then we look at another ayah in Surah uh, uh, Al-Araf. In Surah Al-Araf, we find that um, it is Allah alone who Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Noah, called people to worship as well. Right In this ayah in uh, Surah Al-Araf, ayah 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what could mean, indeed we sent Nuh to his people and he said, oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other God but him. So again, the oneness. Certainly, I fear for you the torment of a great day. And that great day is referring to the day of judgment. Then we look at another ayah. This is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayat number 73. And we find that Isa, uh, salam, Jesus, also called people to worship Allah alone. Surely, 
they have disbelieved who say, who has disbelieved? Those people who say that Allah is the Messiah, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, son of Mary. So whoever says that Allah is Jesus, the son of Mary, has disbelieved. But the, but the Messiah, meaning Isa alayhi salam, said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Verily, whoever sets up partners in worship with Allah, then Allah has forbidden paradise for him. And the fire, meaning the hellfire, will be his abode, meaning that will be his final destination and he will live there forever. And for the Zalimun, the people that are wrongdoers, there are no helpers. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us is that even um, uh, Isa salam, he said, worship Allah. He never said, worship me. He never told people to worship him. Yet, this is what people have taken him as, as, as the son of God or God himself. And then we look at another ayah in Surah Ma'idah, 116 to 117. Um, and again, same similar concept. We find that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying what could mean. And remember when Allah will say on the day of judgment, O Isa, son of Maryam, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? Now, this is interesting. On the day of judgment, Allah is telling us in advance what it is that um, Allah, what, what it is that will happen on the day of judgment. These words will happen exactly as, as, as Allah is describing them in, in these ayat. So, and I want, to, I want to just focus on another point on this as well, subhanAllah. When we look at the translation, because of the way the Arabic text is, where it says, and remember when Allah will say on the day of judgment. I have a question for all of you. Um, I, I hope somebody can try to answer. How can, okay, so the day of judgment hasn't happened yet, right? We're all still alive and, and, and here on this face on the earth. So day of judgment has not happened yet. Why is Allah saying, and remember when Allah will say on the day of judgment? How can you remember something that hasn't happened? Um, this could be to show uh, how certain this day is. So it shows the certainty of this day because it will happen. And it also can show how soon it will come. That's a very good understanding um, that it is because of the certainty of the day. But now it goes beyond the day. Because Allah is saying, and remember when Allah will say on the day of judgment, and then the statement, what Allah will say on the day of judgment. So it's not just even the day, it goes even to the explicit detail of what is being said on the day of judgment. How can we remember this if it hasn't happened? Does anybody else want to try and try and uh, guess what what how you could possibly remember something that hasn't happened? Is it confusing? <laughs> so it shouldn't be. Let me let me explain it, and inshallah, I hope this will clarify it for you. Remember when I was talking that Allah, when I was explaining that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created everything, and I start describing animals, humans, earth, rocks, mountains, sky, uh, earth, planets, space itself, and then I said, what? Time. Allah has created time. Now, because Allah created time, Allah is not bound by time. See, for me and for you, right now is the present. What has happened before is the past. What will happen soon is the future. We are bound by time. We cannot go back in time. We cannot go forward in time. We can only live what we have right now. And whatever is coming next, we don't know, but it is going to whatever happens, happens. Allah is not restricted by time. So what is going to happen in the future for Allah has actually already happened. Let me give you another explanation to try and um, hopefully make it a little bit more clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written down everything that will happen from the moment of creation until the day of judgment. So, 
if you are driving a car or you're in a car, okay, and you're driving down the street and you come upon uh, the, the road ends, you can either turn left or you, you can turn right. You will make a decision at some point whether to turn left or right. Allah knew that before you were even born, whether you would turn left or right. And Allah has written that down, that you will turn in this direction. Now, it's very important to understand this. Because Allah has written it down does not mean, this does not mean that Allah is making you turn left or right. It is your decision. It is your decision. You have the absolute free will to make that decision. It is Allah's absolute perfect knowledge and complete knowledge of everything that Allah knew that this is what you would decide. Okay, and so similarly, because Allah knows this, then Allah has written this. And similarly, Allah knows what will be happening on the Day of Judgment. And so this is why Allah can say and remember when Allah will say on the Day of Resurrection. But the point is, the main point is, it is the certainty. It is that this is going to happen. There is no doubt about this, about the Day of Judgment, nor is there any doubt that this is what will be said. Now, within this statement, Allah is asking Isa alayhi salam, Allah is asking Jesus, son of Maryam, did you say unto men, did you tell the people, worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? I just finished explaining to you that Allah knows everything. Why is Allah asking Isa alayhi salam? if he told the people or not told the people? Am I incorrect in what I was just saying that Allah knows everything? Or are we misunderstanding or am I misunderstanding this, this statement somehow? If Allah knows everything, why is Allah asking Isa alayhi salam on the day of judgment this question that did you tell people to worship uh, you and your mother as gods um, Allah's knowledge is perfect what he said um, I think this could mean that on the day of judgment so that everybody else they can know that in fact Isa salam did not tell them to worship them uh, those two and that the people who worship those two are doing wrong that is absolutely correct it is so that the people can hear it from Isa salam himself. Allah knows the answer. Allah knows that Isa salam did not say this. In fact, the very previous slide, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we, we looked at that other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, that Isa salam said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. So Allah knows what Isa salam said, but on the day of judgment, when all the humans will be there gathered together, every single human will be standing there. Then Allah will ask Isa Islam, not because Allah doesn't know, because the people don't know. And Allah wants to give an opportunity for Isa Islam to clarify what he did or didn't do so that the people will hear and then understand that what they did was wrong. Right? So, Isa, son of Maryam, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? Then he, meaning Jesus, will say, subhanallah, glory be to you. Again, what do we say about glory be to you or subhanallah? Who remembers the, the translation that I, I described for everybody last class for subhanallah? Um, it shows Allah's perfect perfectness. So, uh, so glory be to you is like, all, perf all uh, perfection belongs to you and you do everything that's perfect. Exactly. So you are, so Allah is saying, asking this question and this question is an imperfection, right? It's an imperfection saying, if, if I was to say, worship me people, then that's an imperfection. That's something horrible. So Isa alayhi salam saying, glory be to you, Allah, you are perfect. It was not for me to say what I had no right to say. Meaning, Isa is saying, I don't have any right to say that people to worship me. And had I said such a thing, you would surely have known it. 
Meaning Allah, you would know it. You know what is in my inner self, like my thoughts even, though I do not know what is in yours. You, only you, referring to Allah, this is Isa Islam speaking, you, only you, are the all-knower of all that is hidden and unseen. Never did I say to them, ought except what you, Allah, did command me to say, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. And I was a witness over them while I dwelt, meaning while I lived amongst them. But when you took me up, when, when Allah raised Isa alayhi up, then you were the watcher over them and you are a witness to all things. Meaning Allah, you are a witness to all things. Okay, I'm going to pause for one second here. Does anybody, did everybody understand that? Does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about so far up to this point? Okay, I'm going to assume no questions, so we'll move on, inshallah. <clears throat> then we look at this when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. Verily, I am Allah, none has the right to be worshipped but I, so worship me and perform a salah for my remembrance. This is important because, again, it's about constant reminder, right? What was I saying at the beginning when we were looking at Surah Al Fatiha that, you know, why do we worship Allah? Who do we worship? It's important we understand this and not just pray our salah mechanically. Because if we just stand, get up, throw our hands up in the air, put it on our chest, Alhamdulillah, and just go, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, Allah, anybody can do that. And inshallah, Allah will accept your salah as being performed but whether you get any reward for that salah or not, I don't know. And the reason that our salah is often like that, right? What I call express salah, where you go very quickly, um, is, is because we don't appreciate who Allah is. It's because we don't have a love for Allah. It's because we don't have respect for Allah. That's why we do this. And if you think about it, if you think about it, the definition of worship was what? Love and respect and honor. If you, um, somebody tell me a, I don't know, basketball player or some sports personality that you are very fond of, one of your favorite sports players. Somebody give me one, one name. Come on, I know all these, you guys are on this. Uh, somebody must have some some name in mind. Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant? Okay. Kobe Bryant. He's dead though, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, give me somebody alive, man. It's, I can't, it's going to be harder with the example if somebody's dead. <laughs> LeBron James. LeBron James, okay, khalas. So LeBron James, if if LeBron James came up to you, or you came up to him, you got to meet him, okay. And of course, you're in awe because he's such a great basketball player and such great statistics and so on and so forth. And how would you talk to him? Think of now. Think of now the salah that we pray, okay. And when I say we pray, think of your specific salah, how you pray. Don't don't think of your brother, your sister, your parents, or somebody else. How you pray your salah. And think of the speed in which you are talking to Allah. And not only are you talking to Allah, you're reciting the words, the speech of Allah. Okay, you're reciting the speech of Allah. Back to Allah. And it is supposed to be as a reminder for us to appreciate Allah, to develop love for Allah, to respect for uh, Allah, which ultimately becomes an act of worship then. The act of worship is not simply just, you know, uh, moving up and down and, and turning your head left and right or right and left at the end. Now, if Kobe, uh, not Kobe, said LeBron James, if LeBron James um, is there, how would you talk to him? Would your speed be the same way as we recite our salah? And this man is giving you nothing. Remember this. He's standing there and you have an opportunity to speak to him maybe for, let's say, uh, a few minutes. 
okay? But he's not giving you anything. You're not going to actually benefit from, from anything. He's not giving you money. He's not giving you a t-shirt. He's not giving you anything. What, what would be the manner in which we speak to him? And then what is the manner of our salah when we speak to Allah? Right? And this is something very, very critically important that we need to be very mindful of. Um, and so when we look at this here, when, when Allah is talking to Musa, salam, even in the, in, in the time of Musa, salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him to perform a salah. Why? To remember Allah. And that's the key. That is the important part is that we have to remember who it is that we are worshiping. Because if we lose focus of who Allah is, if we forget um, why we're worshiping Allah, it would be very, it will become very easy for shaitan to start whispering and um, in, into our ears, into our minds, into our hearts, doubts, and start making us lose sight of why we even exist, which is to worship Allah. Okay. Then let's move on to this ayah. So this one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, say, this is to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say, O oh mankind, if you are in doubt as to my religion, then know that I will never worship those whom you worship besides Allah. But I worship Allah who causes you to die, and I am commanded to be one of the believers. So again, we started by talking, or not started, but at some point I was talking about that one of the main points is that Allah is the creator, and it is about creation. That is what one of the key points to, to always keep in mind to help us appreciate who Allah is. Here, Allah is also saying he is the one who causes you to die. So Allah can create, but Allah can also destroy. And when we talk about destruction, we see all sorts of destruction around the world from time to time in the form of what everybody likes to call natural disasters. Okay. Um, and this is, these are things that happen, right? And so we, again, this is to, for us to appreciate the perfection of Allah, to appreciate the power of Allah, to appreciate the completeness of Allah, right? Everything belongs to Allah. Allah created absolutely everything, including death. This is also something that Allah has created for us. Then we look at this ayah in Surah Al-Anbiya, where again, Allah is stressing um, about now angels also worshiping. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what could mean to him, meaning to Allah, belongs whosoever is in the heavens and on the earth. What are the heavens again? We spoke about this last class. Who can quickly remind me what is the heavens? The skies. The skies. So everything that we know of in terms of space, Right, So our own atmosphere, which is called the sky, beyond our atmosphere, which is space, every constellation, every, uh, subhanAllah, the terms are escaping my mind. Everything about space, though, as far as we have discovered, is all the first heaven, right? The first heaven. So to him, and there are seven heavens or seven skies. So to him belongs who, whosoever is in the heavens and on earth. And those who are near him, meaning the angels, because they are near Allah, are not too proud to worship him, nor are they weary of his worship. So here we find out that even the angels are worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we look at this ayah, where everything that is worshipped instead of Allah cannot bring you any benefit or harm. They, and they cannot create nor can they provide. And this is, again, going back to, it is about creation, right? This is one of the key points. It's not only about it, okay, I want to be clear, but this is one of the key things that, that we need to be very mindful of. So 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah at number 76, what could mean say, O Muhammad, to humans, to mankind, how do you worship besides Allah something which has no power either to harm you or to benefit you? This is a question to really think about, to really ponder. How do you worship something besides Allah, which has no power to harm you or benefit you? But it is Allah who is the all-hearer and the all-knower. Okay. And if you think, just, just when you think about that, it makes 100% complete sense. Of course. Why would you worship something that has no power? I mean, if you were to even worship yourself, you probably have more power than an idol does because an idol you've made with your people make with their own hands. They can't do anything for you. In another ayah in Surah Al-Ankabut, ayat number 17, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what could mean you worship besides Allah only idols and you only invent falsehood. Verily, those whom you worship besides Allah have no power to give you provision, your risk. Provision is not just your money, but everything that you have. Okay, this is your the, the, the household that you live in, your clothing, your, your money, all of these things are your risk, your provision. So seek your provision from Allah alone and worship him alone and be grateful to him. To him alone, you will be brought back. So again, this ayah is talking about worshiping the one who gives you everything and to worship him alone, to be grateful to him, but then the, 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 I think the word threat is probably the wrong word, but I'm going to use it because I can't think of anything else at the moment. But then the threat comes you, that you will return to Allah. Right? You remember in Surah Al-Fatiha, I was saying, Maliki Yawmiddin, the master of the day of judgment. There's no threat there, but it's implied because the consequence, meaning on the, that day where there is a judgment and Allah is the one who will judge, then if you did, if you messed up in this dunya, then you're going to have to pay the you're going to have to pay the consequence. And similarly here, you will be brought back to him. So this is, in a sense, trying to remind us to say, be careful, be careful. It's not going to go un unknown, right? It's not like somebody you'll be able to trick somebody here in the dunya and you can run away and you never have to face them again. OK, you you know, you 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 steal some money or you cheat the system and get a whole bunch of money and then you take a flight and you move to another country or you kill somebody and then you move to another country and now they can't catch you or find you. No, to Allah, you will be brought back. You will be brought back. And so this is another point of understanding. Okay, so having said everything and understanding everything that we just discussed, why should we worship Allah alone with no partner or associate? Don't answer yet. I'm saying that sarcastically because everybody, nobody almost answers and unmutes. So I was being very sarcastic with that. Don't everybody speak at once. So why should we worship Allah alone with no partner or associate? This is your homework. I would like you to, each one of you, to please email me your answer. It can be very brief. It can be very detailed. That's fine. But I'm looking for your answer. When I say your answer, that means don't just copy and paste something from somewhere. If you want to research, you want to look some answers up, no problem. That is good. In fact, I encourage you to do that. Okay. But I want you to respond or send me an answer to this question in your own words okay this is this is what's important i want to understand your understanding what your perception is why should we worship allah alone with no partner or associate okay um you all should have my email address because i've been emailing everybody that has registered for the class um, i sent an email this morning for the class time this of six o'clock today and since all of you are here at six o'clock or we're here at six o'clock then you must have received that email so all you have to do is hit reply and you can answer this question inshallah i would like to have everybody answer by end of saturday by end of day tomorrow i don't want you to wait until next week when you know school and classes start again so if you can try your best 
in first thing tomorrow morning or even tonight if you would like that's fine but no later than tomorrow end of day end of day is maghrib end of day is maghrib so before maghrib tomorrow inshallah which gives you more than 24 hours please uh try your best to respond to this inshallah okay can and i hope everybody's saying inshallah they are making a firm intention in their heart they will try and inshallah you will try your best to uh send the answer to this okay and then inshallah next week we will continue with the class six o'clock inshallah the timing will, will stay uh, uh stay as this so from six to seven subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik shayad wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa jazakumallahu khairan wa barakallahu feekum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh